in this video, we'll talk about both hydrostatic and deviatory stress, and they are very closely linked together. All right, and what the and how do they link together? Are uh, that they are actually a subset of a stress tensor. A stress tensor is simply something like this. If you still remember, it's uh, it's totally the stress state. All right, it's just just this one. All right, this is the stress tensor. Just simple any stress tens stress matrix is just a stress tensor, all right. And in this stress in this stress tensor, the trace, all right, the trace, if you still remember, or the diagonal part of this, if you sum them up together, all right, and divided by three, is the hydrostatic stress. We call it sigma h. So it's equals to sigma one one plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 divided by 3 and what is the true meaning of this is just a force acting on the perpendicular side of the cube alright you can have 6 sides because these 3 sides represent another the behind side as well because this one is in the in this axis so it can be in this direction or it can be in this direction so in, so therefore we all we are always representing things in terms of three sides we do, all right, and therefore this is the meaning of a of a hydrostatic. Hydrostatic by name the hydro means that you you are talking about water, talking about pressure, and therefore this is just the meaning of um, that when you submerge the the cube inside of water, the forces will all add perpendicular to the to the surface of the yeah to the surface lah yeah. Therefore, in a more general form to represent hydrostatic, this is the this is the form. All right, where this sigma h, all right, it's all the same. All right, we th we take average of them, and then this is the equation that we we derive right from from this stress tensor. Correct. And the definition, the true definition of hydrostatic, is simply this this sigma h spans across all this so by itself is a matrix all right by itself is a matrix so this is a matrix of a hydrostatic all right so it's totally different matrix from this matrix this is a stress tensor matrix all right please note that all right i i see that this, the hydrostatic tensor is a subset of this one because it comes from the the initial stress tensor in 2d then it's this definition. That's all. Okay. Now, what is deviatory stress? In deviatory stress. Deviatory stress. All right. It's somewhat very hard to determine. All right. So I'll just do out like the the definitions of it. Then at least you know what it is. Is that still we use this stress tensor that is just the cube itself, the number of the the stress components of it. The stress tensor minus away our hydrostatic, which is sigma h, sigma h, and sigma h. Correct? As you can see, it's over here. Alright, so I'm just writing sigma hydrostatic over here. And this thing right here, the stress tensor minus away our hydrostatic, will give us our deviatoric stress. Alright, and what is the purpose? What is the purpose? In the previous video on principal stress, we are focusing on the trace of this matrix, right? We are talking about only the normal stresses. We are only keen to know about the normal stresses. Now, in this situation, our deviatory stress, alright, is to keen, we are keen to look at the, the shear, the shear portion. Now, we are talking about looking at the shear, shear portion all right and in order to look at the shear portion we have to ensure that this portion over here is equals to the hydrostatic or the sigma h okay so in order to 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 show you an example imagine i have a two times two matrix talking about just a plane itself all right we have sigma one one which is the the normal the normal stress and the sigma two two normal stress as the as two, 
both of them and we have the shear stress of sigma 1 2 and sigma 2 1 as 5 and 4 all right this is the stress tensor okay that describe the stress state of the system okay minus away <coughs> this is the hydrostatic if you still remember hydrostatic is taking this thing so I examine 2 plus 2 divided by 2 is equals to hydrostatic so I'm just simply subbing in this hydrostatic over here each of them okay and you may be confused then you may be confused that why don't I sub straight away sub in it or you may you may you may feel that I'm actually straight away subbing in over here no I'm not doing that if let's say this value is 3 then it's 3 plus 2 divided by 2 which is 2.5 and therefore the higher center is 2.5 all right so therefore be, do not be confused by this understanding okay and therefore if i were to do stress tensor minus away my hydrostatic i will have a deviatoric tensor or deviatoric stress sorry and as you can see the normal stresses has has been removed all right while well, we have the components for the shear and in such a case that happened this means that this thing was going to go, gonna go we're gonna go gone. I mean, we're gonna be missing. All right. So it's just in terms of a shearing in this direction, and a sh somewhat a shearing in that direction. So I, I can't figure out how the shape would look like. Maybe some, some weird shape, some really deformed shape. All right. So this, this derivative stress actually tensor. Yeah, this derivative stress is actually talking about the um. Um, the shear stress, but it's not directly it's not directly the meaning of shear stress, but it's the purpose of it can help us to find shear stress. That's that's just the the thing, okay. By definition, the hydrostatic stress is related to, related to volume change, while the derivative stress is related to shape change. So the shear stress only can change the shape, while the normal stress can somehow change the volume of it. I don't know. I'll leave you to think about it. Alright, okay, now let's come back here. Alright, let's let's come up with definitions for the derivative. <coughs> okay, so the stress tensor, if you come back here in the 3 times 3 minus away the hydrostatic, you will give you a derivative stance uh, stress, right? And this derivative stress, I can represent it as a as a matrix over here. Alright, it's just taking sigma one one minus away sigma h. Then sigma 1, 2 minus away 0 is sigma 1, 2. Sigma 1, 3 minus away 0 is sigma 1, 3. Alright, so I'm just doing the tensor operations only. Alright? And therefore, how do I represent this in terms of initial notation? Okay? So how do I represent this? We know that the hydrostatic stress can be in terms of this one, right? Sigma h is sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 is just the trace of a stress tensor correct and then divided by 3 so as you can see what can we say about this sigma 1 1 2 2 and 3 3 all right they are all same right 1 and 1 2 and 2 so I can in in such manner I can say that I have I can rewrite sigma h as sigma kk is equals to sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 over 3 can do that all right as a summation of this if you remember back the for example from i is equals to one to to three something like that i mean for k sorry for k but now right um sorry my fault shouldn't be divided by three sigma one one plus sigma two two plus sigma three three this one can be represented by sigma kk okay sorry my fault my fault all right so sigma h, alright, sigma h is not this one, alright, this, this thing is sigma kk. Okay, now if I sub in sigma kk as this thing, what I will have is sigma kk divided by 3 is equals to sigma h. Alright, so the hydrostatic force can be represented in this in initial notation. Alright, in this initial notation. So I have already helped you to find out the um, initial notation for um, hydrostatic which is one that sigma kk that's all now i sub in into here okay what do i have before i sub in into here we know that sigma one one sigma one two and this stuff 
I can represent in terms of sigma i j. All right, this is just the the tensor tensor style. Sigma i j is equal to sigma one one sigma one two. This is the very primitive way. All right, so I can re-represent them in terms of sigma one sigma um sigma i j. All right, sigma i j. So this is sigma i j minus away sigma h, which is our sigma k k over three. All right, this is one of the matrix. And then this sigma ij, I can also write as sigma ij over here. Okay, so I'm just simply rewriting each of this term in terms of sigma ij, right? For for simplicity's sake, or in, in fact, it should be to be more accurate, right? This is this should be sigma ii, all right? Because it's never mind sigma ij. Okay, let's keep it there. So this notation, this notation is not a good notation, all right? Please do not. Um, take this as real because, I mean, in terms of, um, it's just for for representation of sigma one one for a clear representation. In reality, we don't use this as a representation of sigma one one. Please don't do that. All right, this is, but just in terms of conveying, then I am actually doing right here right now. Okay, now let's co let's continue. Sigma one one can be represented in terms of some sigma ij right because s ij is equals to, for example we can say sigma ij and never mind never mind never mind i'm going to get make, making things more complicated anyway i can represent sigma one one as sigma ij for example okay realistically i we don't do that but for example and i can represent sigma h as sigma kk over three and then sigma one two i do i can just represent as sigma ij and things like that all right and therefore this this whole thing is being represented in this manner Okay, so as you can see, we have a trend. At this portion over here, we have a sigma kk over 3, right? minus sigma kk over 3, while the rest is sigma ij. How do I do an initial notation such that we can actually um, summarize all this stuff? And therefore, we're going to introduce the conical delta. The conical delta spans the space of the trees, right? If i is equals to j, then it is equals to zero. If i is equal is not equals to j, then it is equals to one. Right? This is the condition. So as you can see, it, sorry, it should be the case. <laughs> if i is equals to j, then it is equals to one. If i is not equals to j, then it is equals to zero. Sorry. So therefore, if sigma one one, all right, sigma one one is this is i this is j right this one is i this one is j so sigma one, one so sigma one, one is i equals to j right and therefore um coordinate delta is one and where, where do i multiply the conical delta i will multiply the conical delta at this portion over here because i want to i want to i want i want to represent this this term minus this i want to represent this term like okay I just want to represent this term in terms of other stuff, alright? Uh, because I want, I just want to get a trace out of it. I know what I'm talking sucks right now. I also don't know what the hell I'm doing. But anyway, by multiplying conical delta over at this hydrostatic portion over here, because we know that the conical delta governs the trace of this portion, so we want to keep, we want to keep this, this hydrostatic portion over here la, because we want to represent them in terms of initial notation and therefore <coughs> if i is equal to j is which is equal to 1 all right then <coughs> delta conical ij will become 1 and this is why sigma kk still exists all right now <coughs> this is more clear okay now if i have a system because it's minus sigma kk for example in this case if i now is not equals to j because this is sigma one two right so if i is not equals to j then this is this, this this becomes zero right so this thing minus times this thing is equals this whole thing becomes zero and therefore we only left with sigma ij over here you get what i mean so in o so in order to represent this whole matrix i can simply write in terms of okay so i can represent the deviatoric matrix as this one 
all right when i is equals to one all right then it, when i is equals to j then delta chronicle delta is equals to one and therefore this sigma this one will become one right and therefore sigma ij minus sigma k sigma k k divided by three exists which is inside this diagonal reason this this one over here all right now if i is not equals to j then the chronicle delta ij is equals to zero right and therefore this this thing this chronicle delta will become zero and zero times this um, hydrostatic stress will become zero and therefore what i left is only sigma ij which is why it represents all this triangular stuff over here right all this all this stuff right actually this is not here so because i just want to explain to you right so as you can see we can represent things in 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 such of a way that is easier to to do so therefore this thing is for the deviatoric initial notation and this one all right is for the hydrostatic deviatoric a eh, hydrostatic um initial initial notation <laughs> yeah but not least, if you were to come back here for the devoltoric tensor or devoltoric stress, sorry. What is the principal stress? How does this principal stress apply? Can we apply it? And in fact, we can apply it. Alright, and the principal stress of this devoltoric stress is just stating that it is all zero. A more defined way okay for more more better understanding okay this this whole thing over here is our deviatoric stress all right this thing over here is our principle of our deviatoric stress if you take a look this is sigma one one this is sigma one all right this value is different from this value and therefore be very careful about it all right so you're, when you're talking about principle of a deviatoric st stress, then I would believe that the number over here and this number over here is totally two different numbers. All right, I may be wrong, so therefore I'll just I'll just put it over here. The trace of principal stress is different from the trace of deviatoric stress, meaning that the trace of this of this principal stress is different from the trace of this deviatoric stress. They are they are totally different values. Alright, and this is the summary of this video of why I know why I don't know and will be put in the description below. See you in the next video.